Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final session of Becoming Catholic, Session 17, the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes. Uh, this is uh, the final session. I was breaking it up into pieces uh, to do one session uh, each for each of the commandments and the Beatitudes, um, but since we're getting so close uh, to baptism and confirmation and the act of reception for all of you, I thought, you know, let's just go ahead and tie up uh, loose ends and finish with the final session. So let's set the stage. God has just led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt using Moses as his instrument. After the exodus from Egypt, God led the Hebrew people safely through the Red Sea and dispatched their Egyptian pursuers. When they arrived at Mount Sinai, Moses went out for 40 days and was given 10 commandments written on stone tablets by God himself. The Ten Commandments are not ten suggestions, they're not simply guidelines, and the Church often refers to the Ten Commandments by another name, the Decalogue. Now, Deca in ten, uh, I, I mean, means ten in Greek, and Logoi comes from the Greek Logos, meaning word. Now, Logos is not translatable in English simply as word. In Catholic tradition, beginning with St. Justin Martyr as early as the first century, the Logos, which was a, a Greek philosophical concept, is identified directly with the Word of God. That is, the one eternal Word of God. Uh, and of course, this is the word that St. John also uses in his Gospel when he says, in the beginning was the Word, Logos, uh, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And he uses Logos each time. The Logos to St. Justin Martyr is, quote, the universal principle which animates and rules the world. Um, so the Logos is fire. The Logos is life. God's word is creative. Remember, God says, let there be light, and there was light. So there's also a parallel between God's word and his wisdom. In the Old Testament, when wisdom is mentioned, it points to the Logos. So in ancient Jewish thought, the Logos was an intermediary, between God and man, and was more of an idea or power or symbolic personification. However, we see clearly, especially in the beginning of St. John's Gospel, that the Logos is not simply an idea. The Logos is a person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now this word is not the Greek lexi, from which we get the word lexicon. The word that St. John uses is Logos. So Jesus is the Logos. He's the Word of God. He is the wisdom of God. We have to remember this when we read Scripture, especially the Old Testament. When we see the Word of God or wisdom of God, it's the person of Jesus, the Son of God, of whom is being referred. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the Decalogoi, are not simply ten sayings. They are the Ten Commandments from God himself. The same Word of God which breathed life into the world speaks here with absolute authority and sovereignty. St. Paul says in the first letter to the Corinthians, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. God is perfect. He's all-knowing. He's all-present. He's all-loving. He's all-powerful. And yet, how many times do we pretend that we are God or that some collective majority knows best? The very first of the Ten Commandments reminds us that we have but one God, and that all these other gods in our life are false. I, the Lord your God, I am the Lord your God, you shall not have strange gods before me. This is from Exodus chapter 20. The second commandment, you shall not invoke the name of the Lord your God in vain. God's name is holy, which means set apart. It's not to be used as a curse word, nor is it to be used in swearing vows. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Do we do servile and unnecessary work on the Sabbath on Sunday? Or do we intentionally treat Sunday as it was meant to be, a day of rest, a day for re reflection, a day for leisure? Do we fulfill our duty and privilege to worship God in the Mass on Sunday, or the anticipated Mass on Saturday evening? Fourth, honor your father and your mother that you may have long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So do, do we respect our parents and honor them? Do we honor the memory of our parents if they passed away? Parents, do we honor our children and do everything we can to lead them to heaven? Fifth, you shall not kill. Do we stand up for the lives of the innocent? Do we treat dying people with dignity and respect by forbidding even the thought of euthanasia? 
Do we defend the rights of preborn children and work against abortion? Do we avoid slander and gossip and the killing of the reputation of others? The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. This does not simply mean to engage in relations outside of marriage. Are you trapped in an addiction to pornography? Do you find your eyes wandering when they should be guarded? If you're in an irregular marital relationship, are you working with the church to regularize your status of communion with the church? Do you watch television shows or movies that are leading you away from virtue? And then seventh, you shall not steal. Have you been guilty of shoplifting? Do you return things that you borrow in good condition? Um, so we can see here that, like with this one, the seventh, it's not just about stealing, it's about even taking care of the things that don't belong to us. The eighth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Luckily, everyone follows this commandment today. Of course, I'm joking. Um, are you honest when you speak of others? Do you tell lies to make yourself look good? Do you tell lies to make another person look bad? Uh, the ninth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's uh, wife. And then the tenth, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So in our materialistic society, we can covet so easily. Do we watch advertisements on TV or billboards and think, I need that? If so, we might be coveting. In our society, this can be very simple to do. God invites us to be grateful for what we have and to have a well-ordered relationship to things. We must seek to love God above all else and love our neighbor as ourselves. And then when we, when we, and then we must not love things but use things uh, to making sure that we're loving people and using things. This is the first step to not covet people or things. So I want to just walk briefly through the Decalogue in an inverse way. So we're going to be reading the commandment as it is and then look at the positive formulation or phrasing. I am the Lord your God, you shall not have strange gods before me. In other words, we could say, be single-hearted toward me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So we could say, be reverent in speech and conduct. Remember to keep holy the Lord's day. In other words, keep priorities. Honor your father and mother. In other words, be respectful and obedient. This includes to the rightful authority. You shall not kill. Defend life from the womb to the tomb. You shall not commit adultery. In other words, be faithful to vocation or future spouse. You shall not steal. In other words, be trustworthy. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Be honest in word and deed. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Have only pure admiration. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Be grateful for what you possess. Pope Benedict the said sixteenth, uh, who's often known as a, a rules guy and kind of rigid, um, uh, was quite not that. Uh, it's unfortunate that he gets that rap. But anyway, he said this about the Ten Commandments. He said, "Christian ethics and faith do not stifle love. They make it strong, healthy, and truly free." That is the exact meaning of the Ten Commandments, which are not a series of no's, but a series of yeses to love and life. So the Ten Commandments are there as guardrails. They're life-giving. They lead to freedom, true freedom. Jesus <clears throat> gives us the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest sermon of all time. He assumes the Ten Commandments and builds upon them in a masterful way. And of course, we can't forget that Jesus is the Word of God. And so, as our good teacher, he's building upon what he has already given us. So let's jump in. The beginning disposition of our lives as Christians ought to be this statement. It's not about me, Lord. It's about you. How beautiful and good would the world be if everyone believed and lived this? It's not about me, Lord. It's about you. How beautiful would our own lives be if we lived this? Imagine the peace that would dwell in our hearts. The more we diminish ourselves and hand ourselves over to God, the more we truly become the person we are meant to be, the person God created us to be. As the saints before us were diminished, the Lord was magnified. Yet in doing so, the saints become more uniquely themselves. This is the reality into which God invites each of us. When we put God at the center of our lives, we find true happiness. 
When we get practice every day in each of our interactions, do we treat others well and act as instruments of God's will? When we're at Mass, are we there for ourselves or, do we, or to serve and worship God? Do we complain about the priest or the music or someone sitting in our seat? Or do we thank God that we have a priest and music and that son or daughter of God who is worshiping alongside us? When we talk to other people, do we gossip and slander or do we preserve other people's dignity? God gives us so many beautiful opportunities to grow in sainthood. And we're all called to be saints. In Latin, the word for saint comes from sanctus, meaning holy or set apart. But sanctus also means blessed or blessed. And this blessedness is the gift which God offers to each of us if we're open to it. Truly, blessedness is what every human person is constantly pursuing, whether they realize it or not, because all people want to be happy. There are a tremendous amount of things that people argue about, but we don't argue about happiness. We say, what good is wealth if it doesn't make you happy? But nobody says, well, what good is happiness if it doesn't make you wealthy? The ancients used words like, like uh, eudynamia in Greek and beatitudo in Latin, which means true, real, lasting blessedness. In our modern world, happiness has come to mean a subjective feeling or contentment or momentary satisfaction. But is this true, lasting happiness? God has revealed in Jesus Christ a different idea of happiness. Our modern notion of happiness has to be turned on its head. In order to increase, we must dis decrease before God. In order to be ourselves, we must die to ourselves. Most people who are chasing happiness chase the following nine things, according to Peter Crave, doc, uh, Dr. Peter Crave, a philosopher at Boston College. Wealth, conquest of nature and fortune by science and technology, freedom from pain, self-esteem, justice and securing one's rights, sexual pleasure, winning at war, sports, games of chance, business and our fantasies, etc. Honor, acceptance, to be loved or understood, and a long, healthy life. To assert that happiness consisted in the opposite of these nine things would be insane, and yet this is precisely what Jesus does in the Beatitudes. Many people, Christian and atheist alike, hail the Beatitudes as good and noteworthy, even commendable. But if we hear them with fresh ears, we see how seemingly insane Jesus' words are. Through living and practicing them, though, we come to realize that true, real blessedness is possible. Though the inversion of the norm seems insane, we come to know that Jesus is maybe the only sane person, and the rest of humanity is varying levels of insane. So let's walk through these. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our human sensibilities tell us to desire wealth. Christ responds, blessed are the poor in spirit. This word for poor in Aramaic means bent down, afflicted, miserable, poor. Christ is likely referring to the whole of the condition of the poor as beggars. There's a true humility there, a low estate, a social dependence, a defenselessness to justice from those with more economic riches and might. Yet it's the poor in spirit who possess the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not only a place or a goal to be attained, it's a way of living, a state of mind, an outlook, a perspective. The state of mind of the kingdom of heaven is the same as we pray for in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. Our human existence apart from God is the most tremendous poverty. Without God, we are swallowed up by sin and death, but by the blood of Christ from the cross, we are redeemed. If we embrace this redemption, we will one day enjoy eternal life and our salvation in Jesus Christ. It's this acknowledgement of a Savior that truly allows us to be poor in spirit. Borrowing the imagery of G.K. Chesterton, when we're poor in spirit, it's as if we're walking on our hands, seeing the world hanging upside down, depending and resting on God. God is the ground of our existence. To our wishes to avoid pain, Christ says, Blessed are they who mourn. Mourning is the expression of the discontent within us. Instead of viewing suffering as a meaningless action, Christ teaches us that suffering can be redemptive. When we suffer and mourn with Christ crucified, we will find comfort. This comfort may not come in the form of physical healing or a deliverance from suffering, but the pill of sadness will be sweetened to be more bearable. Our end goal is heaven. This destination, however dismal the journey, is still glorious. 
as the mystic and doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila said, looked at from the point of view of heaven, the most horribly painful earthly life will turn out to be no more than one night in an inconvenient hotel. Jesus Christ gives himself to us. His viewpoint is heaven. And so he shares this viewpoint with us. I just realized while I'm recording this that I forgot to put the next um, ones up on a slide, so I apologize, but it, it's this. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The meek don't wish for honor, or to be famous, or to be glorified. These are the people that God says will inherit the land. Meekness is not weakness. I've heard meekness described as strength under power, under control. The meek don't wish to compete, and they don't want to conquest nature. This is after the example of God, who we should be trying to imitate. God rules the earth and everything that's in it, and he does so anonymously oftentimes. Many of his actions in the physical world are given other names like entropy and gravity and thermodynamics. This isn't to say that nature is God. Far, far from it. God is above the created order. But he did set it in motion and sustains it. When we imitate God's model for interaction with creation, including one another, we get at the heart of what it means to be meek. What is the meaning of life? This question is asked so often in philosophy. For some, the answer is the accumulation of money, power, fame, land, or military or athletic conquest. Rather, life's meaning is found in wisdom, love, creativity, understanding, sanctity, and beauty. Competition depends on material things which diminish when shared. When we give something away, we no longer have it. However, with spiritual things, what we share in meekness and cooperation is not diminished, but is magnified. So meekness is the opposite of competition, and this leads us to true, real blessedness and lasting happiness. We human beings wish for self-esteem, satisfaction, and contentment with ourselves, and for some reason we believe that we will find this within. How many have said they want to go out and find themselves? Yet Christ says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And just look at the example of the lives of the saints. These holy men and women throughout the ages that we hold up as models of true, real blessedness were often deeply countercultural. As G.K. Chesterton said, a dead thing goes along with the stream, only a living thing can fight against it. They did not seek to be self-satisfied, but sought and said for the greater glory of God and the other. Paraphrasing uh, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal, Dr. Crave puts it this way, There are only three kinds of people. Those who seek God and have found him, these are wise and happy. Those who seek God and have not yet found him, these are wise and unhappy. And those who live without either seeking God or finding him, and these are both unwise and unhappy. You see, it's the seeking, the hungering and thirsting that makes all the difference. In fact, the eternal difference. Jesus said it even more succinctly than Pascal. Jesus spoke more succinctly than anyone ever. Seek and you shall find, implying that non-seekers do not find. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness means to seek sanctity. There's a thought that this means that we will be satisfied in the life to come in heaven only, but this isn't so. Through seeking Christ on this earth, we will receive on this earth the peace and joy uh, in, a, in a foretaste that only he can give. As St. Augustine said, because God has made us for himself, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. The world does not seek mercy, it seeks out justice. The world over, all people seek out their version of justice to give people what is due to them. And there are certain rights which are entitled to all. The chief among these is life. If anyone has their rights restricted, we fight for justice. On a personal level, if an injustice is done to us or our loved ones, we pursue justice in order to put things right. Justice is certainly a good and valuable thing, but it alone does not lead to true real blessedness. Treating others as we wish to be treated is the beginning, the foundation. But justice must be combined with mercy, 
Mercy is the love of God reaching into our brokenness. When we reach into the brokenness of another without condemnation and work to lift them up, this is justice. Let's approach it from a different angle with a difficult question. What would it be like if you got the exact justice that you deserve? Now, we're all sinners, so we likely would not like the answer. We have hope in the mercy in which we were made. In our sinfulness, our Lord became man in order to give us, give his life for us, rise from the dead, conquer sin and death, and save us from our own wretchedness. Our unhappiness is our own. We were created not in wretchedness, but in mercy and love. By learning to live in Christ as we were meant to, we learn how to offer others mercy instead of chasing our own brand of justice. And we'll find that in giving mercy, we will obtain mercy. As we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As God redeemed us and set us free, he offers us mercy. We must do likewise to all. The sixth beatitude refers to the clean of heart, also called the pure in heart. And this is about our desires, both spiritual and corporal. In order to see God, we must have clean and pure desires. Our desire for physical intimacy, for example, can be twisted in one of many ways. The family is the fundamental building block of society, and yet half of marriages today end in divorce. One third of mothers in the past years have chosen abortion. This is the choice to be able to fulfill sexual desire without worrying about the natural good and pure consequences of the sexual act. And this beatitude all comes down to this. Do we serve God, or do we make a God out of our disordered desires? Impure desires such as lust, according to Dr. Peter Kraft, are a blinding of the reason, a remarkable narrowing and skewering of vision, of perspective. When we let our minds and hearts be distorted by the pleasures of this world, we're giving in to empty promises, which are merely distractions. If we give in to the various distractions of life and do not let our hearts and minds be clean, pure, and focused on God, we will never see God. On the other hand, as St. Paul tells us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting that Christ does not say blessed are the peaceful. Instead, he says blessed are the peacemakers. There's a definitive action here. We're called by God to make peace, to be warriors against war, to fight for an end to fighting. Peacemakers are held in high esteem by most people in the world, so is this really that countercultural? But Dr. Kraif answers the question this way. Because the peace that Christ blesses, uh, uh, blesses is the peace the world cannot give. It is peace with neighbor, self, and God, not with the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's not a peace with greed, lust, and pride, but the peace that comes through poverty, chastity, and obedience, three most countercultural virtues. These two kinds of peace are, in fact, at war with each other. To be a peacemaker, we have to embrace Christ's radical peace, and we have to fight for it. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, we have been at war with the enemy, Satan. We judge the enemy as wicked, we repress the enemy, and through Christ, negate his effects on our lives by clinging to holiness. We do not become children of God by being peacemakers. Rather, it's only as children of God will we be able to be peacemakers. As true Christians, we will be rejected and hated by the world, just as Christ was. The kingdom of heaven is our reward for enduring persecution well. We have a poverty of love within this world. We crave love from the fallen world, which is not of Christ. Persecution on its own is not blessed, but it becomes blessed when paired with righteousness. And this is not being self-righteous, for we know with St. Paul that holiness is Christ in me, and apart from him, we can do nothing. When we're willing to carry our own cross, we are allowing the kingdom of heaven to reign within us. As Christ said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? This passage sums up the Beatitudes, and answers 
our human desire for life. If we lose our life for the sake of Christ, spiritually speaking, we become a new creation in Christ by the power and authority of Christ. All the desires of mankind are answered by Jesus Christ. In his death, we receive life. Through him, we are redeemed and are offered eternal salvation. And this is the meaning and purpose of our lives, to know God, to love God, and to serve God imperfectly in this life and perfectly in the next. As St. Ignatius of Loyola said, God freely created us so that we might know, love, and serve him in this life and be happy with him forever. God's purpose in creating us is to draw forth from us a response of love and service here on earth so that we may attain our goal of everlasting happiness with him in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, help us to become saints. Make us holy. We know that it is only through you and with you that this is possible. Send your Holy Spirit to inflame our hearts and allow us to see as you see, to love as you love, and to serve you in all things. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.